And what this says is that if you have a function that's continuous on a closed interval, then you're guaranteed for that function to have a maximum and a minimum value. And these aren't relative maximum and min, these are absolute max and min. So for example, very basic function, which is the quadratic um, parabola, f of x equals x squared. And let's suppose it's defined on the interval, the closed interval from minus one to two. So when you have a closed interval, it just means that you're including the endpoints of the interval. And this interval represents the domain for my function. So all the x values that are used as input for this function are going to range between negative one and two. Okay, they're gonna lie, x is gonna lie within this interval and it includes the endpoints. That's why I use these square brackets that show that they're included. And that's what a closed interval is. It means it just includes the endpoints. And this function is continuous. So if I draw a picture of this function, and I'm going to just draw a sketch um, for the general function x squared like this. But if I wanna look at the, on the closed interval, okay, I'm going to, have th this point from this point, negative one to two, right? This, these are X values. So I'm going from negative one to two and the Y values range from zero to four, okay? So the, the lowest point for the Y value is zero. That means this point right here is the lowest for my parabola. Now, it doesn't have a maximum if you consider the whole entire x-axis. In other words, what I've drawn in pink here, there's no maximum. However, if we define our function on this closed interval, then only what's part of the curve is what I've drawn in blue here. So it, it goes from negative one to two on the x-axis and from zero to four. So you can see the maximum value on the closed interval is at four. Here is it's at two and the value is four and the minimum value is zero and it occurs at X equals zero. So when we talk about maximum or minimum values, we're talking about Y values. When we're talking about where are they located, we're talking about X values, okay? But suppose I didn't have this graph the extreme value theorem guarantees that the absolute maximum and minimum will occur at the critical points, including the endpoints of the closed interval. So here's the critical point where the tangent is equal to zero. That's the relative, in this case, absolute minimum. But then if we include the endpoints, those also are possibilities for locations of max or min. So you wanna test all of those critical points. So to do this, the first step is to find the derivative of your function. In our case, for x squared, the derivative is 2x. Then the second step is to set the derivative equal to zero. So 2x is set equal to zero um, and solve. And if we divide both sides by two, we get x equals zero. And then, um, so I'm just gonna write, uh, let's see, a note here. 
set f prime of x equal to zero and solve for x. This, of course, is how we find the critical point. So um, this x is a critical value, right? And then the endpoints for your closed interval are also um, critical values. Okay, then step three, you want to go ahead and plot these in a table or list them in a table, I should say. So we have X and then we have F of X. The X values are our critical values. So here we have zero and then we list the endpoints, negative one and two. And then you're going to take and plug these into your function And you get the function is, of course, x squared. So 0 squared is going to give you 0. Negative 1 squared is going to give you 1. And then 2 squared is 4. Now, again, the extreme value theorem tells you that your max and min are going to be in this list here. OK, and you can just look. This is the highest value, and this is the smallest value, the lowest. So this is your maximum and this is your minimum okay and the way we word this the way we write this out is we say that f of x has a minimum value and of course, we're talking about absolute minimum of zero at zero on the interval zero, three. And then we say that f of x has a maximum value of four at two on the interval zero three, okay? So these values, the function values are the values of the minimum and maximum. And then the X values are the location for where those minimum values occur. So here we have a value, a minimum value of zero at zero, and then we have a maximum value of four at two, okay? Any questions on that one? The three, where did the three come from? Oh, <laughs> actually, that's a good point. <laughs> um, I just wrote the wrong interval. I think I was looking at another problem I don't know where I got that from. I think there's another problem with zero and three. So thank you for pointing that out. This, I meant to say negative one, two, negative one, two. Thank you for pointing that out. Very good, okay. So that is given to us and that's what I meant to, to write. I don't know where, I think there's another problem that we did do. I, I, this is the third time I've done this lecture. <laughs> so sometimes I get, kind of mixed up or my wires get crossed. Okay. Um, let's see, any other questions? All righty. Let's look at another example. This was taken from your homework or at least there's one similar to this on your homework and it says the problem is worded to find 
the absolute extrema for f of x equals 4 plus 5x minus 5x squared. And this time it's on the interval from 0 to 3. That's where that 0 to 3 came from. Okay, so we have the first step one is to, to find the derivative of your function. And in this case, the derivative of 4 is 0, the derivative of 5x is 5, and the derivative of negative 5x squared is negative 10x. Then step 2, you're going to set f prime of x equal to 0 and solve for x. All right. So you get 5 minus 10x equals 0. I'm going to go ahead and subtract 5 from both sides. And then I'm going to divide both sides by negative 10. And I get x equal 1 half. So this is a critical value, but I also want to include zero and three, which are my endpoints. So in the table here, I'm going to list zero, one half and three. So the zero and three come from the interval and the one half come from the first derivative setting it equal to zero. Now I'm going to plug each one of these into my function Plugging in zero into my original function, I get four because this will be zero and this will be zero. Plugging in one half, and you can do the calculation, but when I did this problem earlier, I got 19 fourths, which by the way is about 4.75. I mean, it is 4.75. And then when I plug in the three, I got negative 26. So these are the values where the uh, minimum and maximum occur. I mean, these are the values where they occur. These are the actual values. And so you just look, which one is the maximum? And the reason why I put this in decimal form was because it's easier to compare it to the other numbers. So here you can see this is more than four. So this is my maximum. And then of course the negative number is gonna be my minimum. So we say that F has a maximum of 19 fourths at one half. And that's of course on the interval zero to three. And then F has a minimum of negative 26 at three on the interval zero to three. Okay. Any other or any questions on this one? Now, um, this prob, this next problem, so this is like number two on your homework. Um, let me just write that up here. And I also want to do help you through problem number four because it's an application problem. So I just want to discuss that one a little bit. So that will be my example three. So no questions on this one? Okay. And the problem reads like this. 
an employee's monthly productivity M, which is the number of units that the employee produces in a month, is found to be a function of the number of years of service, okay? So for a certain product, um, M of T is equal to negative four T squared plus one nine, 192 T plus 200. All right, so what this is showing us is, so you've got an employee, and by the way, this is on the interval from zero, um, with, so T is, which is the independent variable is between zero and 40. T is the number of years of service. And M is the number of units produced in a month by that by an employee. So this is a model that shows you that if you are just starting on the job, in other words, your years of service is zero, okay? You're just starting fresh out. You are expected, according to this model, and so if I plug in a zero here, I'm expected to produce 200 units. That means I have no experience. I'm just shown how to do the job, and I just dive in there, and I can produce in one month 200 units, okay? Well, as I'm on the job for more and more years, my productivity is going to increase. And so this M is going to go up. And then as I age, maybe I reach a certain peak of, of, of um, productivity. And then as I age, my productivity starts to go down. Okay. So that's what's happening here. We want to find out when is this, when is an employee going to have the most um, the bet, the most units produced in a month. And in other words, the best productivity, how many years of service where does that uh, um, occur at? Okay. So we find the first derivative. That's always your first step. And notice that we're on a closed interval. So this is from zero to 40. This is interval notation. And because of these equal signs, I'm using the square brackets. And so this is a continuous function because it's a polynomial and it's on a closed interval. So by the extreme value theorem, I know that the, the maximum and minimum are gonna occur um, at the critical values, zero, 40, and whatever value I get when I take the derivative here. So always your, your first step is gonna be to take the derivative. Two times negative four is negative eight t. The, the derivative of this is the constant 192 and the derivative of 200 is zero. So I'm gonna set this equal to zero. I'm gonna subtract 192 from either side. And that means that negative 8t is equal to negative 192. Then I'm gonna divide both sides by negative eight. And so I get T equals 24 years. Okay. And if we check the productivity, um, so in other words, T and M of T, we're going to check it at the 24 and then also at 0 and 40. So 0, 24, 40. And like I said, at zero years, your productivity is 200 because I'm going to plug zero in here. and That will be zero plus 200. And then um, let me see here. Okay. Um, I did this problem earlier. What did I get? Let me see if I can find it. Um, oh, I don't know where I put my notes for this problem. Oh, 
I'm looking. Hold on. I guess I'm going to have to get the calculator out and figure it out. Oh, wait. No, that's not it. Oh, well, I'll just do it, I'll do it on the calculator. see it? Yeah, you can. Okay. So I'm going to plug in the 24 into my function. So it's going to be negative 4 times 24 squared. And then I'm adding to that 192 times my 24. And then of course, I'm adding the 200 at the end there for my function and I get 2,504. I write that in my table, but before I move away from the calculator here, I'm gonna do 40 as well. So I'm going to take my negative four times 40 squared, and then I'm gonna to add to that 192 times 40, plus the 200, and I get 1,480. So I've, I've written those in my table. So I plugged in 24 and 40 to get these two values. And now I'm going to look at those values and decide which one is the minimum. And of course, as I said earlier, that one makes sense because you have no experience. So that's gonna be your minimum production is at the start of your job. And then the maximum productivity is going to be right here and kind of at, in the middle when you reach your peak. And then of course it goes down at the end of the 40 year period after 40 years of service, it's estimated to be at around 1500, okay? So that is the way we interpret this or the way we write this down is we say, An employee's maximum level of productivity, which is 2,504 units per month, occurs at 24 years of service. Okay, li listen to the language that I'm using here. Notice I use the word level when I'm talking about maximum. Level means the height of the function, okay? The height is the vertical axis. Um, and this is the value on the vertical axis. In other words, it's, it's the level of productivity. So this is the output. Where does it occur? It occurs at 24 years of service. So see, at refers to kind of where. It answers the question where. That's the horizontal axis, which is your time. So at 24 years, you have this level of... So that language is important because it, again... It's a reminder to us that the dependent variable is the height of the function and the independent variable is the in the horizontal direction that is the location that we that we that yields a certain height or a certain level you see that how the language works there and um i in my experience of teaching math it's, it's something that students get confused. And so I'm trying to really hit that home and, and kind of make a point to 
emphasize that. Okay, so um, I think I've covered enough from this section. Let's move on to section 3.5, which is really just another use of, we're doing more application problems similar to this, where we're trying to maximize functions. So 3.5 and 3.4, those two sections really go hand in hand and